Good evening, Dominica, the Caribbean region, and the rest of the world. It is great to be joining you once again for episode number 14 of Roots Connections on Q, right here on Q95. So again, good evening, Dominica, the Caribbean region, and the rest of the world. It is great to be joining you for episode number 14 of Roots Connections on Q, right here on Q95, the big station. I am Simone Matthew, and as always, I hope that you're in good health and great spirits. We have another packed two hours of programming for you as uh, we continue to explore and acknowledge all the changes which are occurring in the world around us. You know, we always look to both sides of the coin when we talk about change. We like to talk about the positive and the negative aspects of change, uh, the changes that we explore on this program. But alas, those of us who are not among the super rich, the super wealthy of the world will find it uh, extremely challenging to find the benefits in the change that we're about to discuss this evening. So this evening we're exploring the Pandora Papers. What are the Pandora Papers, you might ask? How did this information come to light? And why should we care uh, to help us to understand and digest this information? We are joined today by Mr. Pat Aaron, legendary songwriter and tax consultant. And he should be joining us in just a little bit, either via phone or via the WebEx platform. We are also joined by Mr. Kent Vital, um, economist. And we are joined by Mr. Lennon Matthew, a geologist well known in Dominica for being a commentator on issues of national importance. So good evening, gentlemen, and thank you for joining us today. How are you? Let's make sure your mics are unmuted as we welcome you to the program. So you can go ahead and unmute your mics and say good evening. Yeah, hi, hi, hey, hello everyone, good evening. Um... Very, it's a pleasure to be on this program, uh, my very first time, and hopefully not the last. <laughs> but yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Lennon, I'm very familiar with Simeon. I, I've known you from before. So it's just my pleasure. It's always my pleasure to share with the people because this nation is special. This nation is precious. And we've got to lift this nation up. We cannot afford <laughs> to lose this nation. We've got to restore our nation. Um, to, to, to where it was and lift it even higher. So I'm always happy to contribute to any discussion in that regard and to um, be a part of persons who will not just discuss, but would also be willing to, to take the right sets of actions to lift our country higher. Yes, absolutely. And Lennon, how are you? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Um, good evening to you. Good evening to uh, Q95. And good evening to uh, the listening public. Um, just want to say thanks uh, once again for inviting me to share my thoughts um, with the listening public. Kent, it's nice seeing you again. You, you look pretty different today. I, I must add a transformation. Um, but but more importantly is is while we while we talk, I think the most important thing is to share um, our deep thoughts, our ideas, to have an in-depth perspective of the things that affect us around the world, in our country, at home, in our communities, and how our ideas and our thoughts can generate discussion, generate deeper thoughts, and most importantly, generate action. Because, um, you know, uh, uh, conversation, without an objective is useless uh information without without action is useless uh thoughts without action is useless uh, and i think more, more importantly if you have yeah if you have deep conversation then your decisions tend to be be more 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 have more depth and and, and more meaning and more purpose for 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 the um the action intended so thanks again for having me and hopefully we have a, a uh, in, insightful, informative uh, discussion, and, and hopefully we can spur, even if it's one or two people to act, um, act responsibly, um, th that would be a victory. Yeah, so I just want to check in with the studio to ensure that you can um, hear me. Lambi, can you hear, hear us okay? Yes, excellent. So I want to make sure that we are connected and we are doing well. Um, Lambi, I can't understand your hands gestures. You want to say what you're trying to say to us? Is there a call on the line?
We'll just wait, give Lan me a minute. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Yes, so if you can still hear us, just give us a thumbs up to let us know that we're we're connected. Okay, so we have another full two hours of programming for you. But before we get started, let us say a pleasant good evening to our Q95 listeners at home and abroad. Good evening. If you are joining us via Facebook Live on YSQFM, Push Past 10 or DA Rose, uh, don't forget to share and like and click the notification button so you will always know when we go live. Uh, we are looking forward to engaging with our Facebook audience as well as everyone who will call in to the program at about 9 p.m. this evening. So a pleasant good evening to Mr. G, the Q95 family. I'm Lambi on the console who will facilitate our calls, as well as showing Norris, our engineer, who will take, who keeps us connected. So don't forget, if you missed any episode of our program, you can head over to q95da.com at any time to view the episodes. For example, last uh, time we discussed what if a sale on the stock market and the missed opportunities for Dominica. So that is now available on q95da.com. So you can head over there to check it out as well as all the rest of our great programming. So again, we say good evening and welcome um, to the panel. So far, we have Kent Vital and Mr. Lennon Matthew, and we're expecting Mr. Pat Aaron to join us shortly. So again, uh, we always like to begin the program by recognizing that our identity comes, our strength, I'm sorry, comes from our identity. So we'd like to start the program off by simply playing um, homage to where we come from and anyone who may have been instrumental in our formative years, anyone, any institution. So Ken, since you are the newest uh, uh, panelist, we will go ahead and get started with you. Right, right. Well, well um, the Q95 listeners might be quite familiar with me by now, um, but but um, the most important way I identify myself um, is that I am someone who who loves my God, and I submit to Him, and I do everything in my power to live righteously. And um, I translate that to politics because the scripture says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And so much of what has gone, gone wrong with this world and definitely in Dominica is because of a lack of righteousness. Sometimes we use other words like integrity, <laughs> but, but, but really that's so much of it. And secondly, I always um, think of myself as someone who loves God first and then loves my family. I have a beautiful family, wife, three daughters, and I love them dearly. I live for them, <laughs> live for God first and then live for them. And then, then I say, I love my nation. And you know, you, 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 you've got to, to love people. You've got to have a heart for people. And if there's one thing that I always say that I hate, I have a lot of love in me, but if there's one thing that I hate, it's poverty. And there's just too much of it in our land. Um, too many people are hurting. Too many people are, 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 are not living up to their full potential. And I, I, I'm the kind of person that unless, um, you know, I am happier. I'm happiest when I see people doing well. I'm not the kind of person that wants to be up there and everybody's down there. That doesn't, that doesn't um, um, do anything for me. Um, but when I see others doing well, I, I live for that, to see others doing well. And by, you know, by the way of background, of course, I'm a, an economist. I worked quite a bit with regional agencies, first with the um, Eastern Caribbean Central Bank for a couple of years, and, and then with the Caribbean Development Bank for um, 10, 10 or, or more years, and uh, before I entered into uh, more directly into the political realm in Dominica, where I served for a while as the, as the um, political leader of the Federal Party. But my passion really is to lift our country, to rid our country of poverty, and to lift our country to where it really can be. And I've seen so many examples from the region um, uh, of, of, of how we approach development and um, the, the, the bad governance 
uh, that, that, that occurs in so many cases, uh, it is really one of the major reasons for our underperformance in the Caribbean. And, and corruption is just one element of it, and a very big element of it. But a lot of our underperformance is due to extremely bad governance. And um, part of what I want to be a part of is, 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 is restoring or, or getting to a position of good governance in our countries, not just in Dominica, but in the, in the entire Caribbean. Anyway, I think I've gone, I've said more than just my identity. But I'm from Roseau, Roseau Central. And uh, but I live in the countryside now. In in the, in the um, you know, I'm from Rosa, but it's amazing. I love the country. I love planting. I love being in the soil. And <laughs> so so that's me really. Uh, yes, yes. Thank you for sharing that. And we've just been informed that Mr. Pat Aaron is joining us via the telephone. So we will go ahead and have him just introduce himself. Of course, of course a man who really needs no introduction, but. In keeping in line with what we are talking about, just tell us where he was born and raised, some of the values that he learns growing up, and any person or institution that played a major major role in his upbringing. Pat, can you hear us? Lamy, we can't hear the studio. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, but can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Go ahead. Very good. Um, Simon, first of all, let me um, hail up all listeners to this program and um, the other guests on the program as well. Because what we're discussing tonight, basically, I'm, I'm becoming more and more convinced that this discussion is about what the greatest human tragedy, you know, in the existence of man. Because what is happening, especially where the um, Pandora Papers and other such elements are concerned, is the basic misunderstanding by key people about the simplicity of life and how their basic misunderstanding of life has caused generations of people to go through poverty to be unable to fulfill their commitments, to be unable to, to reach their full potential. This caused generations of people to die of starvation and hunger because a few people, and in many cases one man, misunderstands that we just sojourn us here on this earth, we're just passing for a little while, where we should try to live the world a little better than we met it, enjoy life, make people happy, help people with that we can. And that's the basic thing of life because we're only passing it through for a little while and then we're gone. But some people misunderstand that and they think they need to have all the money in the world and hoard the money away from, from the people and have people suffering in perpetual poverty. I think this is about the greatest human tragedy and something that can be avoided. Yes, yes, thank you for that. And Lennon, your introductory um, comments? Yes, um, so, you know, I always like to start by by stating my humble beginnings. Um, I'm from the village of Benz, Benz and Zimian Solo. I grew up in the village of Benz. My mom was a, a preschool teacher, uh, Lucina Matthew. My dad was an elementary school teacher. And, and these two folks have, have in different ways had a serious impact on my life. Um, I remember growing up in my community, um, my dad as a school principal, during the summertime, my summer vacation was spent raising animals. We, ra we raised pigs, um, we planted yams, um, plantains, dashing. So I know what it is, uh, I know what it is to, to, to be around farming. Uh, in the spare time, my dad also did some fishing and, uh, and that's how we, we lived our life. But one of the things that amazed me is as a school principal, um, we had to do other things to be able to, to, to live day to day. We had to do, you know, farming and fishing just to supplement uh, the salary that my dad was getting as a, as a school principal. I have three other siblings, it's just four, uh, six of us in the family. And at the, at the tender age of eight, 
my dad um, took me from the Benz um, primary school and I, I, I walked to Vegas to go to primary school for a year. Um, most eight-year-olds were trying to get out of bed. I was <laughs> five o'clock in the morning catching a bus and walking sometimes from, from Blenheim to, to Vegas to get to school at, at, at eight years. And then the following year, I, uh, I uh, spent another year at the Pebush, um and primary school. And at the age of nine, I was in a common entrance class and I sat the common entrance exam at just 10, 10, got a pass, went to PSS, spent more than I should at Postman Secondary School, um, spent two years at the Clifton Dupinney College and came back to PSS, taught for two years, taught geography. And uh, after two years, um, went to pursue an education, uh, got a degree in geology and um, and uh, manufacturing engineering processes. Uh, for the past 10, 16 years, but for the past 17 years, I've been doing environmental um, assessment in Texas and Florida, and I'm currently um, pursuing a master's degree with uh, with uh, focus on energy management. And it's 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 really interesting the, the kind of things that are out there that we are not aware of. So you know, all in all, the, you know, along these experiences have molded who I am. My dad has taught me how to be disciplined. My dad has taught me how to be determined. I imagine an eight-year-old eight -old waking up at five in the morning to catch a bus and walking from, from uh, Blaine to Vegas. You don't have a choice. <laughs> so, so these experiences in life make me who I am. One of the things that, that you know, for a long time, I can't, I can't stand injustice. I can't stand people being abused and, 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 I think if we don't speak out, if we don't take a stand, if we don't stand up, we are just as guilty as the ones who are committing these atrocities. And, and I have asked myself a question, even if I have left Dominica, Dominica is always on my mind and my heart. And I've asked myself a question, when it's all said and done and my kids said, my, my kids asked that, what did you do to make a difference? I don't want to say I had done absolutely nothing. I want to say, you know what, I stand up, I fought, and even if I didn't have to, I participated because Dominica is our, our homeland. And I think what affects us um, most is our inaction, not our action. I think we are responsible to, to, to chart the destiny. And, and as a Christian nation, we have been taught good morals and values. And I think the hardest thing for us is to put it into action. So, you know, just, just, just a lot of stuff, but hopefully we can have this conversation and see that it's not just a, a, a social issue, it's a moral issue. And um, we'll take it from there. Yeah, and I can already tell that, uh, you know, we have the perfect guests for this program because you, everyone so far has talked about working hard, discipline. But I think what we're going to, to realize with this particular program is that the wealthy simply play by a different rule, a different set of rules. And it seems like those who are criminally uh, minded are ready to emulate them by following their lead. So I'm truly happy that we've had this opportunity to connect with everyone who's joining us on the program. And just a quick programming note, of course, we know tomorrow is the by-election in Grand Bay. So I want to reserve a couple of minutes towards the end of the program so we can talk about um, the importance of that by-election. And I also want us to tie what we're talking about today into the unrest that we're seeing in many parts of the world, such as Guadeloupe and Martinique. So I just want us to tie everything um, together as we get started. So again, if you're just joining us, this is Roots Connections on Q. And this evening, we're looking at the Pandero Papers. What is it and why should we care? So gentlemen, if it is okay with you, I thought I would get the conversation started by providing an overview of what we are talking about um, this evening. So if most of us will recall back in 2016, there was what was called the Panama Papers where about 11 million, 11.5 actually million documents were leaked to the media to show how the super rich are able to hide their wealth. Well, I want you to think of the Pandora Papers as the Panama Papers on steroids. So this time in 2019, even more documents were found in excess of 12 million documents. And as the Guardian newspaper puts it, think of the information found as almost a million Bibles filled with leaked documents from about 14 law firms and other financial service providers operating in more than 40 countries. 
It shows how the businesses help funnel money for elite clients from all over the world to hide ownership of property and other high value assets. And yes, some of these companies are right here in the Caribbean with close to 5,000 such companies in South America, Argentina, Brazil, and Venezuela. So the Pandora database is the largest such lick to date and it still only represents a tip of the iceberg. So what does this mean? Well, it means, uh, and the Guardian continues, that this means that the world is losing between 400 billion and 800 billion in tax revenues to tax havens each year. So the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, who were the ones who discovered this, um, claims, tells us that the monies are held in offshore uh, companies outside of the country where the money uh, the money was made, and it ranges from 5.6 trillion with a T to US 32 trillion dollars. So let's take a pause here and let's just get our feedback from the panel, your thoughts, anything you want to add. And since we have Mr. Pat Aaron on the phone, I thought we would go ahead and start with him. And then, Kent, you can tell us, you know, the impact of not having that amount of money in any particular um, nation's economy. Pat, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, go ahead. Your feedback? Well, like, um, first of all, I'd like to make a little correction, not just to your words, but to the words of the writer in the um, Pandora Papers, where they always say where the rich hide their money. It is not their money, you know, it is the people's money. Mm -hmm. so, so it should be referred to as, as stolen money, especially in the case of leaders of countries hiding the people's money away in foreign banks, foreign countries. And do you know, in many cases, it has happened many times, I've read it, where these guys don't even know how much money they have hidden outside. Nobody knows how much money, not even their, their, their family knows because they have to keep it a secret. And many times they die and this money goes stays to the bank and in some cases, even to some bank managers. While the people in the country are suffering. Now, I know um, there are offshore banking in itself, of itself, may not necessarily be a bad thing because you may hide your money in, a, in your personal money in a foreign bank for, for, because the bank, for the stability of the, of the um, currency in that country. But when you are, you are a leader of a country handling the money of the people and you, 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 you're stealing the money and hiding it away, causing hundreds and thousands and millions of people to starve, that is, like I say, probably the greatest human tragedy. And all because some people don't understand that we're just passing here for a while. And all you need is enough. But money never seems to be enough. And the quality of leadership in our country, in the Caribbean, in the world, the quality of leadership has dropped and the world is suffering for good leadership. It's in very few countries that you would hear that a leader has that ethical standing and would try to wipe out corruption. But for the most part, it is quite the opposite. And um, it, is, it is a very, very sad tragedy that the world is facing now. And, and with all the, the agencies, the law enforcement agencies, even they too have been so compromised that, you, you know, the world is like almost ready to throw in the towel because so few people stand for integrity. And, and against corruption in government. 
Yes, thank you for that. I'm, and I'm happy, I'm happy you pointed out the question of whether this, this is illegal because I did some research on this and the BBC.com reports um, it, it says, is it illegal to use tax havens? And here's what they say. Loopholes in the law allow people to legally avoid paying some taxes by moving their money or setting up companies in tax havens. But, is, but it is often seen as unethical. So I think we will have a very important debate this evening about legality versus ethics. There are also a number of legitimate reasons people may want to hold money and assets in different countries, such as protection from criminal attack, criminal attacks, or guarding against un unstable governments. Although having secret offshore assets is not illegal, using a complex network of secret companies to move around the money and assets is a perfect way to hide the proceeds of criminality and what criminality are we talking about there have been repeated calls for politicians to make it harder to avoid tax or hide assets particularly following previous leaks such as the panama papers however the panama papers show that the people that could end the secrecy offshore are themselves benefiting from them so there is no incentive to end it in a nutshell, the concept of the tax of tax the rich is simply not working. Uh, Kent, I can see that you're itching to jump in. Yes, so no. go ahead. And then, no, then no, we're coming quite, to you. No no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're doing quite well. I'm just listening nicely. But um, you know, part of what we wanted you, you or you asked earlier on is I mean, what kind what can that kind of money do um, for a country? And um, at the beginning we were talking about the Pandora Papers and why should people care? Why should people be interested in in corruption? Why, you know, and I wanted to focus a little bit on that, but the kind of money we're talking about is a lot of money. Obviously, it's the number of individuals with money um, in, in offshore institutions, but, but think of the economy of Trinidad and Tobago. The GDP, the total production of that country for a year would be about um, 24 billion um us dollars so we're talking about um a number of times that kind of money being would be been hidden in, in in offshore kongs um but the thing is there is a criminal element to a lot of this i i i think a lot of these these these, these hidden monies um are ill-gotten games are either from money laundering or from direct theft or fraud or or, 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 or or other types of illicit payments that they have gotten and it's in their interest to to put the money outside and hide it outside and the question is why should people care about that the man gets his money he puts his money outside so what but we should care not because we are concerned about the individual with that money because the truth is what can you do with um one billion dollars <laughs> you know, I, I, I am never worried about the individual using that money because one billion, I mean, more often than not, they, 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 these people are very miserable people who really don't enjoy the money anyway. I mean, they, I guess they may enjoy some sort of power to it. So that's really not my concern. And, and that should not be our concern. Our concern is really is, what, is, the, is the people that they are depriving. When you take that kind of resource from a country, like in the case of Dominica, it's, it's said that in terms of the accountability for the CBI funds, as much as four million, four, four, um, four billion dollars is unaccounted for. Now, compare this to the size of Dominica's economy. Dominica economy annual GDP is about half, uh, half, a, mil, um, half a billion US dollars. You're talking about having eight times that amount of money unaccounted for. I mean, think of this. Eight times what we produce annually goes into somebody's pockets or is unaccounted for in some way and assumed it's placed in those offshore banks. Now, think of what that kind of resources could do for Dominica. Think of all the, 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 the infrastructure we need to spur economic development. Think of the international airport, think of the, our roads, think of all the other types of infrastructure we need 
to, to really put us in the place where we can raise people to the level that we want them to be. So we're talking about when people engage in that kind of corrupt behavior, they are robbing the people of resources that could be used to get people out of poverty. You know, the level of poverty in Dominica is as much as about 29 or 28%, I think, the last count. It's huge poverty. So when people engage in corrupt behavior, you may say, well, you know, they, they have the money and so on. But the truth is, this is the very money we need to, um, to get people out of poverty. But what it does, it creates an unequal society as well. And, 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 and um, the, when you have an unequal society, what it, 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 it really means that there is not as much cohesion in the, in the society as you would like there to be. And often that's reflected in, in behaviors that reduces our ability to enjoy our country. So you, you find people engaging in, in, in ways, in crime and criminal activity, often because they do not feel their part, because they feel there's inequality. They feel that they are those who have and, 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 and possibly have gotten it in ill-gotten ways, and therefore um, they, they feel that they, their only recourse is to also engage in, in, in actions that would um, bring them some personal benefit as well. So, so, so it really hurts our equation, and it results in in um, in deprivation of our country. Um, now, the other thing is that what you find about this is that think of persons who engage in that kind of corrupt behavior, especially for small countries like ours. They often do not spend that kind of money in the country. You know, they spend it on apartments in New York. They spend it on investments overseas. So the truth is, all and, and they spend that kind of money, not just overseas, they spend it in the very rich countries, in America, in, in the UK, in Europe, and so on. They spend it in these countries. So all they're doing is making those countries even richer, making those countries even better off, while at the same time depriving their own countries of the resources. So rather than focusing on developing their own countries and closing that gap between the rich countries and the small countries, their very corruption really makes that gap even wider, but that's of no concern to them. They're only looking for their own um, self-interest. Now, what, what also happens is that when people get involved in that kind of corrupt behavior, they are concerned about hiding their resources. They're concerned about managing those resources overseas. And guess what? The kind of attention they ought to be paying to our own development, that kind of attention is not given to our development. They are, chances are they are smart people, but the attention is, 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 is taken elsewhere in terms of managing their, their corrupt resources and growing their, their corrupt empires. And guess what? These people, you, you think you're employing them and they, they have these resources and, and you say, oh, good for them, they, they have this money. But guess what? The attention is not on you. The attention is on managing. So you should care what's going on. We cannot accept corruption. We have to reject corruption because it hurts us. It hurts the country from going forward. It creates more poverty. It creates more inequality. And, 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 and it's just something that, that we just cannot continue um, to live with. Now, let me tell you something else it does. In our kinds of countries, or small countries especially, bona fide investors, they look to make a decision. They look to a number of factors in making a decision as to whether or not to invest in a particular country. And one of the things that they they look for is, 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 is the governance. And, and there are various indices, uh, for instance, like the, the, the government perception, the governance perception index, and so on. So when our countries and, our, and officials engage in corruption, our country begin to get a reputation for being corrupt. It affects our reputation. And that reputation hurts us in terms of attracting investors. And I have given this story before, but I remember once when I was looking for some investments for a friend of mine, um, who was going to, who were trying to encourage to get involved in the political process and i sent it to a gentleman in, involved with investors overseas and um he took a while to get back to me and i i, I said I, I called him and asked him well i mean why haven't you gotten back to me he said well can't you know something it's not the project there's nothing wrong with the project you sent to me but the investors i have sent this to they said to me there is no way i would invest in a country like dominica and no way it wasn't the project. It was the reputation that we had begun to build as a corrupt country. So when people get engaged in corruption and we do not reject them, when we continue to vote for them and elect them and have them over us, 
just because they bribe us, just because they give us a little part of the corruption, a little part of their ill-gotten proceeds. I, I, I remember I read something today that suggested that there was about $1.7 million in, um, in computers or so that was being given in Grand Bay. And um, there seemed to have been the indication from the Labour Party or something like that, that that money isn't government's money. It's really the money of the, of, of, of the Labour Party. <laughs> and the government money, and they almost were boasting in that. But the question becomes, how, how where, where did you get that money? And chances are, it's from very corrupt proceeds. But guess what they do? They use a little bit of it to bribe the people, right? And 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 then, so. But we have to learn to to reject corruption because it comes back to hurt us. Because investors can also see what's going on, and the real good investors will will never decide to come in countries that are that are corrupt. So we have to understand corruption hurts us. It's like a yes, hurt. yes. So let me right. uh, we, uh, you can say more a little later. Okay, go ahead. Yes, yes. And and I wanna and, and thank you for that, um Ken. So I want to come over to Lennon now, but I also want to remind us that because of the layers of secrecy involved in many of these offshore and hidden uh tax havens, you find that the illicit funds are hidden. Um it opens the door to bribery, money laundering, um, tax evasion, and the financing of terrorism. So, oh, you know, Ken started talking about why should we care? So here are some of the reasons that we, could, we should care because it does contribute to the continued corruption and degradation of our society. So Lennon, I know that you have some thoughts you would like to contribute. Yes, um, just let me know if you guys can hear me. Yes. But I would like to look at this in a couple of perspectives. And, and the first thing that is at play here, it's the intersection of, I think, um, our social responsibility and our moral responsibility. If we've looked in the past, you know, I speak to Dominica especially because most of us are, we are called a Christian nation. And what is the moral responsibility? The moral responsibility is to be our brother's keeper. The moral responsibility is to uh, control and, and acknowledge that we are sinners and we all fall short of the glory. What is that? We may tend to be greedy. We may tend to be selfish. We may tend to have lost. We may tend to have an excess of those human weaknesses that cause us to do things that, that we should not be. Greed is one of them. I also understand that it is also wise, um, you know, as an individual to save uh, your hard earnings in times of excess. So in times of little, for example, drought, disasters, uh, um, you know, it happened in the past, that you have supplies. We've seen examples in the Bible of wise men and foolish men. Wise men save uh, uh, the excess and were able to feed their starving population. A foolish men or foolish leaders um, squandered their excess. And, and when hard times hit, their followers, followers, followers um, um, perish. Why am I bringing this out? Because we're talking today about how much trillion? Trillions of dollars, 32 mm -hmm. trillion dollars being hidden in offshore accounts. When we when we when we when we look at the Bible again, who was one of the most hated men in the Bible? Matthew, the tax collector. We look at the imperial um, governments of the past, the kings and queens. Uh, what did they do? They collected taxes from the peasants and the poor working people, and it get it got to the point where the inequality got so bad, and the peasants who were in the majority got so poor they rebelled. Uh, what it created is that 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 uh, 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 wealth gradient. And anytime there is a steep gradient between rich and poor, oh. good and bad, hot and cold, you're going to have friction. So this is this is where the moral aspect comes in. We have to ask ourselves our question. Why is there so much greed in this world today? What oh, drives yeah. this is essentially greed. And I understand that, you know, it's wise to save for a rainy day. Any government should do that. Any household should do that. Anybody should do that. But but when when does it hit the excess level? When it when does it hit the the deception level? When does it hit that greed level? When it does it hit that dishonesty level? 
when does it hit that theft level? Because there's a thin line. I mean, it's good intention because it's human, it's human behavior. The next responsibility is the social responsibility. If we have a society where most of the revenue is generated from the sales of goods and services, and the people who 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 who, who cause you know those revenues to increase are the, are the people who working hard, the, the, the taxpayers. And, and they trust that when they pay their taxes, the government is going to put it in the system. The leaders are going to put it in the system to help the entire country. It's an unspoken word. The basic reason why we pay tax is, like I said, is, is, is to help in that moral responsibility. For example, there are schools to be built, there are roads to be built. So all of us collectively put that money together so that we can develop the country so that I don't have to say, I'm gonna build that road, but because I contribute 5% of my income, uh, I can contribute 5% of his income and 70,000 people contribute 5% uh, 5, 5 of their income. It's a responsibility of the managers of that money to make sure that that, that works for all of us. That is our unspoken, our own, our spoken responsibility that is why the tax are here we have to understand that so it, it's 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 really dishonest to see that leaders the wealthy people are hiding this money in havens because they're not satisfied with what they have they're not satisfied with the basic needs of life really and truly what we really need to survive is the basic needs food clothing and shelter everything else is a luxury we have been we have been provided with everything we need to survive our intelligence the plants the birds and I mean you just name it so 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 the hurt that it causes to the majority of people and no no at this point the world has 7.9 billion people right? Only 1% of the earth, uh, of the population, controls 99% mm -hmm. of the wealth. That's a serious inequality. Remember what I said, the laws in nature, when there is a steep gradient of, of two opposite, there is going to be instability. If you have a high pressure and low pressure, you're going to have strong hurricanes. If you have a steep gradient between the wealth and the poor, especially when there are lots of, 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 of poor suffering people, and very few wealthy people, we have seen it with Louis XVI in, in France, we have seen it with the, the, the evolution of communism. That is why it evolved, because there were kings and queens and, and rulers who hoarded everything, and the poor and the masses were suffering. That is what it leads to. And when the world goes to the point where people are hoarding money while the majority of the world is suffering, what it leads to is instability and chaos. Eventually, it will get here. So are you surprised that we are having revolutions? Are you surprised every time you turn on the television there is some 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 match or some frustration and people are burning stuff? It's not it's not magic. It's not it's not it's not it's not unheard of because it's a trend. When these things happen, people rebel. And 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 the worst thing that can happen, you have few people hoarding, and that is where our social responsibility comes in. The other part that is that is stupid to me is if I'm living in a country, and and we have seventy thousand people and only 15,000 people can afford to buy goods and services. That means you have a serious segment of the population who is not even contributing to the wealth. So the country is not even reaching its, its full potential. So therefore, hoarding all that money, keeping it away from the people who are spending it, is even denying the country reaching its full potential. So that is how dangerous that is. We've heard year in and year out, the UN is talking about alleviating poverty. We're talking about um, alleviating poverty in the Caribbean, in African countries, in the in the US, there is poverty. And 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 when 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 we have wealthy people hoarding that kind of money, what they are essentially doing is creating a, an extension to the problem that exists. Our moral responsibilities are is abdicated and 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 the world gets into chaos. And where we are heading, all the demonstrations, all, all, all the frustrations we see what happening right now is as a result. Perfect example. 2020, we had we had a pandemic. And as a result, 100 million people were, were, were trashed into poverty because they did not have enough. And while you have 100 million people living on the edge of extreme poverty, and by the way, extreme poverty is measured in five dollars and ninety cents US a year. There are uh, uh, more, if I should say, there are people who are living on five five US dollars. 
that's the poverty line, one of the poverty lines. And the reason why they look at the extreme poverty line is because these are the people that are, that are most vulnerable. And you're talking about 100 million people in a pandemic. It tells you the state we are in. And I, 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 I think it's not only sinful, it's, it's socially irresponsible. And when, when leaders don't lead by example, what do you expect the people to do? The followers are going to do the same thing. So therefore, it's a destruction of our society, increasing crime, increases lawlessness, and in, increasing disrespect for leadership. And, and that's what we have and, and we see happening right now. Yeah, and I, I certainly think that you make a very good connection, and Ken's did as well, in terms of making that connection to, for example, why we see so much unrest in Guadeloupe and Martinique, because in addition to fighting against the vaccinated, I think people are fighting over the fact that 1% um, is in control of 99% of the wealth and, and the other 99% of the population. Uh, is completely dependent on them. So I think we're, we're unpacking a lot of great information that we will continue to explore this evening. And Pat, we are coming over to you. But by the way, in case you're curious, it is called the Pandora Papers because um, the documents may prove to open a Pandora's box in terms of investigations and lawsuits. So if anyone is curious. Now, who exactly is involved? Who are some of the names that we may recognize? So we have about 35 current and former national leader, um, uh, 400 public officials from nearly 100 countries and more than 100 billionaires. So, so Lennon, as you already said, like how much is enough? So we have to explore that as well. And, and Pat, the, the area that I want you to comment on is uh, some of the activities were legal, some of the activities that they found in these leaked documents were legal, but could not be justified. So for example, some of the files uh, were showing the date of 1970, but they were actually created between the years 1996 to 2020. Pat, how is this even possible? Is he still with us? Simon? Yes? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, I'm here. I just want to add a little to the contribution made by Kent a while ago, especially in regards to quantifying the amount of money so that people can, Dominican people can more clearly understand the value of, miss, of, the, of the missing money. Um, well, every now and then you hear, in, well, right now in America with President um, Biden drive to build back better, I'm hearing about $12 billion and several states are vying to get their portion of it to help build back infrastructure in the state. $12 billion in America. So I want you to hear Dominica is missing $4 billion. $1 billion can fix Dominica in. $1 billion. A billion is a thousand million. So one year America talking, several states trying to get their share of the pie of $12 billion, and little Dominica, $4 billion unaccounted for. That is crime, you know, that is criminality, that is super crime. You know, that is so, so Dominicans can understand the, 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 the quantity of that misappropriated fund. How can a little country like Dominica recover from that or, 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 or live with it? Sorry, that was somebody. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. how, can, how can Dominica, how can that happen? You know, that is for deal. I mean, under no government in Dominica prior to this current excuse for government. I've never heard about a hundred million dollars, you know. Is five million, ten million, you know, two million like um when our real estate report with Taiwan. Taiwan is to give Dominica about two million dollars apart I mean apart from other assistance, but two million dollars. That's what we see about not we never used to hear about hardly see a ten million or twenty million dollars. And now that sounds like chicken feed to the level of corruption that Dominica is exposed to. 
And um, like I said, it is the, 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 the level of the tragedy have not been realized, you know, because in Dominica right now, I have found that one of the biggest problems that single parents or even face is to refill their gas cylinder when it's empty, you know. And that has that leads to to um, um, the oldest um, the oldest tradition. Mm -hmm. Where you know to to refill a cylinder. And many people, many single mothers are facing that, and have to resort to prostitution. Children are going away to study on scholarships, and they cannot, and they have to abandon their studies because of lack of funds. That is the that is the kind of 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 pressure corruption brings on the average people, you know, the citizens of a country. When leaders of the country who get an opportunity to serve and establish their greatness, we're just passing through this world for a little life, a little a little time. And how much money is enough? How much, how much do you want? You know, you have your people suffering in poverty, cannot buy a cylinder of gas when their cylinder is empty, cannot refill their cylinder, and you have billions of dollars outside hidden. And like I said earlier, in many instances, they die and the money never gets back to their country. You understand? Mm -hmm. So we, we, we have to talk about that seriously to try. I mean, we, they say we talk a lot, but talk is important to try to get to the conscience, the hidden and the, the, the dying and the dead consciences of these so-called leaders. That is what we're dealing with here right now. Yes, thank you, Pat. And that's exactly where we're headed next, the societal impact. But um, Lambie, showing if you guys can assist us, um, mic, the mic on uh, Pat is a little low, so any assistance that we can get on that. And Louisa, thank you for pointing that out. Speaking of Louisa, we are coming to the Facebook comments in just a minute, and I'm not sure if we'll be able to take the phone calls this evening because Pat is on the line, but we're coming to you in just a minute for your feedback. But just in, in, in terms of some of the names that are involved in this before we talk about the societal implications. So we have people such as the British uh, Prime Minister, Tony Blair, uh, the Chilean president, the Kenyan president, and we even have famous entertainers such as Elton John, Ringo Starr, uh, to name a few. Of course, their lawyers are all denying that uh, their involvement in terms of hiding assets, but who knows? So let's go ahead and talk about the societal implications because we started uh, talking about that. And I think that is really the gist of the conversation for this evening, because the sad reality is that while billions of human beings try to survive without jobs, they're hungry without access to decent education or healthcare, why are millionaires and even billionaires allowed to grow richer and even avoid paying taxes? Why are the super rich able to hide trillions of dollars in offshore accounts, safe havens, and tax shelters, you know, and I think it begs the questions, how much um, wealth is enough? What is the motivation? Is it because of status? It is because of position in society. So let's get into uh, the mid of the matter, like Lofty likes to call it. So your, your, your comments on what I just mentioned, any one of you? Yes, well, okay, well, well, well let me start off there. You know, it's, 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 sometimes it always baffles as to, as Lennon had asked, how much is enough for some people? Be, because clearly, person, I mean, for, there's, there's so much they can do in terms of uh, direct enjoyment of that kind of money. I mean, how many houses can you sleep in at one time? How many cars can you drive? You can have all of these things. Um, but I suppose there is some prestige in, in, in having so much money. Um, I, I, so I, I, I suppose that's part of what they're going for. Who has the, you know, the ego? Who has the biggest bank account? Who controls more companies? Who controls more money? I suppose that is part of what drives them. But I, I personally, I'm at a loss, maybe because I don't have that character. I'm at a loss to see why that would be any big thing to anyone. Yeah, but, but somehow some people enjoy power, they enjoy prestige, 
and um, it's never enough. And somebody else is always better than them and bigger than them, and they always have to outdo the other person. It's just never enough, and they go for it and go for it. So, but my 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 concern is a little closer home, because while you have people like um, you know the the British and some of the prime ministers in the richer countries or some of the well former prime ministers and so on, engage in corruption in those countries. Uh, some of them do it for, well, not corruption, but putting money outside. Some of them, as Lennon had said, may do it for legitimate reasons. Uh, they may be trying to avoid taxes. And um, they find loopholes in, and ways in which they do that. And, and, and to them, people like Trump, that's a smart thing to do. <laughs> so give that to them. But when you bring it closer home to smaller countries like ours, the people who've stashed money outside, these are not people who are trying to avoid taxes necessarily. These are people who are trying to hide ill-gotten gains. These are people who are trying to hide monies that they, they stole directly from the people or they have gotten through money laundering and some of these illicit means. So, so, so these are these kinds of, of, of people. But for small countries like ours especially, it really is a cancer when people begin to engage in that kind of corruption. It causes a rottening of the whole society. And you may ask how and why can one person's corruption rotten the entire society? But if we think of it carefully, you will see how. To start with, you have to recognize that these corrupt officials who have all these money in other bank accounts, they never act alone. They always have accomplices. You to get to 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 put away four million dollars from Dominica's money. You must be working with somebody in some ministry of finance or some ministry, some official in the government must be aware of what you're doing, and they're either turning a blind eye or they're doing it directly and deliberately. So you are corrupting many of the officials. And when you corrupt officials like that, their attention also turns to protecting themselves and watching their backs. Their attention is no longer just on the work that they ought to do. So they hardly work alone. And in the process of their corruption, there are many others that they bring along with them. And then our government becomes less effective because they are not as focused and... Um, and that, that's just the reality, um, part of what happens. They often hire corrupt people. I remember this, this minister in, in one country that I used to go to, doing work for CDB, that it was said of him that if he were to hire someone, he would ask a number of questions, but the final question he would ask, or one of the questions for sure he would ask is whether you have gotten involved in the past in any any corrupt activity and the person who was most corrupt is the one he ended up hiring <laughs> simply because he knew what he was doing and he wanted like-minded people to work with him so what happens in societies like that when you have corrupt leaders unchecked when we do not have when when we do not reject them or we don't have the systems to to to, to find them out and to and, and, and to reverse what they have done and, and, and to correct what they have done, when that's unchecked in that way, you have those persons corrupting and bringing in other corrupt leaders. And we see that in Dominica all along. Just look at the kinds of persons who are made heads of boards. Look at the kinds of persons who are made, who are given promotion. Look at the kinds of persons who are brought in to, to be consultants or whatever especially when they are directly hired by the government. If they're hired through like a, a CDB or World Bank, it might be a little different, but when they're hired direct, directly by government, just look closely. And what you would begin to see is that, 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 that these guys also hire like-minded people. So you are never getting the best skills. You're always getting persons who have other motives, who are there not to protect the interests of the country, but they are there to protect the interests of the persons who hire them to do those those, 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 those evil works and uh, and to protect their own interests because chances are when you hire somebody to help you to be corrupt they themselves will have their own types of corruption going on so it's, it's really a cancer that continues to 
eat at the country. Then they, they corrupt the police. And you know, when you have a corrupt police force, what happens? And then, um, as I said before, they, you, you don't attract bona fide investors. But what you also find happening is that you have, you're beginning to find other persons in society beginning to look at what's going on. They're beginning to see that people can, can acquire health or wealth without very hard work. And they begin to imitate that behavior. They begin to behave in similar ways, sometimes in smaller ways. Right? So, so, so what you have is, is a, an entrenching of corrupt behavior. And it begins to hurt us. And, and, and sometimes, sometimes you may have one official stealing a million, a billion dollars. But when that kind of culture gets, gets, gets entrenched in the country, and then you begin to have a thousand, a, a thousand let's say, officials Still in a thousand dollars, you big it begins to add. So that kind of culture when it settles in, it's not just the bigger guys, but the small guys emulating them, and you you see the impact on the country. You see how our resources do not go far enough because quite a bit of our resources goes into private hands, goes into to serve private interests, and and it just continues to eat at our country. And even the persons who are not corrupt in that way. Even the bona fide um, or, 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 or the person who works in, in the ministry, then he lacks, he, he's not motivated. So he looks and he sees that he's working for this minister, or working for this boss who, 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 who is so very corrupt and he's just not motivated to give up his best. So, so what you have is a, a civil service that people just do the minimal that they, 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 that they, that, that they can get away with and our country just doesn't go forward so so you, so you see when you have that kind of corruption for small countries like ours it infects the entire country it keeps back the whole country and as pat continued to say uh, think of those kinds of resources and what they could do for our country at this point in time think of the state of our agriculture think of the kinds of poverty that's in our land Think of the plight of our small business people. Think of the state of our manufacturing and our tourism. Think of the state of our villages. Think of how we could transform our country with, yes, the four billion, but also all the other little bits of corruption that occur simply because people are just emulating what they see at the high height. This is a cancer we need to root out. And I suppose at some point we will talk about how do we turn things around and we'll get to that. But it's definitely a cancer. We need to, this has societal impacts. This is definitely rotten in our society. I often say that, you know, maybe, and we have to admit it, maybe in, 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 in our country, maybe in several other countries too, but definitely from my point of view, I think for a long time we have had what I, I call a culture of corruption somehow we think that it's okay or if we get into a position where we can help ourselves and we don't help ourselves then we are foolish and when i say help ourselves we mean i mean um, illicitly then if you don't do it you know that's a culture we have had but that's a culture we need to reverse but you know what happens a bad leader the kinds of leadership that we have in dominica right now what they do is they entrench that culture they exploit that culture because they think people will be Will, will be sympathetic. People will not outrightly condemn them and, and say that they are terrible. People will, will generally well think that they are smart, like Trump, <laughs> to be corrupt or to hide money or to avoid paying taxes. That's the kind of culture that we have. But bad leadership exploits that culture. That's what's happening in Dominica, exploits that culture. And in the process of exploiting the culture, they entrench the culture because yes. everybody yes. else wants to do what they do. I've heard stories about persons in ministries in Dominica. And sometimes you think it's only the ministers involved, but they do their own bits. They work with the ministers to engage in corruption, but they too do their own bits of corruption. So it's, 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 it's the, the, the government and the corrupt leaders, they entrench that culture and they just bring our country lower and lower and lower. But what a good leader does is recognize that culture in our country and do everything to reverse it. And there are strategies you could use to reverse the culture of corruption. And we maybe talk about that a little later. But yes, and I really, 
And I want us to talk about how do we turn this around, but I want to come to Lennon as well as Pat for their feedback. But you're correct, um, Kent, that what we find is that others want to emulate the wealth and the opulence of the super rich, and may, this may lead to increase in crime, right? So, for example, now we see a number of flash mobs of criminals storming high-end stores here in the U.S., uh, 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 most likely to sell the items. For they, they grab whatever they can get their hands on because they see that these options that the super wealthy have at their disposal, it's not available to the average man. The average man does not have the ability or the funds to be able to start an offshore account. So what do you do? You resort to the closest method of gaining the wealth and the opulence that you see that others have that you uh, do not have. So I wanna come to, well, let's go to Pat first and then Lennon will come to you. Yeah, we can barely hear you. Hello. Yes. yes. Good. Is that my turn, Simone? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. I didn't catch that. I, I know um, I was brought into the panel to discuss uh, a little bit of the taxing issues where these monies are concerned. Um, I know, I know that, um, like I, I hinted earlier. Offshore banking on its own, it may not be a criminal or an unethical activity. Mm -hmm. uh, reasons why there are valid reasons why you could want to have an uh, have your money in an, in an offshore bank. Um, like I say, for the stability of the currency, you know. But if your money is fairly and honestly earned, but what you find in the practical in life practically unless you most times and not in every situation unless you have an ulterior motive or your money is not very clean you would hardly want to open an, an offshore account an offshore account you can open an offshore account if it lasts three to five hundred dollars in many banks mm. but um in most cases it is done to hide money from taxes and to hide money, even more so, money that was stolen from people who are suffering. And like I say, it is, it is, a, it is high, high criminality to be doing that. And like I say, it causes so much poverty, so much poverty. You, 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 you know, you, you have to wonder how much money is enough, you know, how much money is enough. We're just passing through this space for a little while for about this. How much money do you need? You know, more money than you can ever spend, more money than your generations can ever spend. And there is never too much talk on this, on these issues, you know, because that it is so cancerous to man survival that you can never stop talking about it and you can never stop making these people feel guilty enough because it is it is detrimental to the whole world and um, there, there are so few people in high positions who are taking a stand against that, that it becomes something like a boys club now, instead of, instead of some people fighting against it now, they're looking for the opportunity to do the same. Instead of like some Caribbean leaders taking their compatriots to task, like your leader for Car of Dominica, and you know, like a leader in any of the other islands is doing those things to their country. You're supposed to pull him up. Tell him, boy, you cannot do that. Don't take quiet to see how far he will get away, to know how far you can get away yourself. You know, and it's like I say, it's never enough talk about it, you know, because 
These people must be made to feel uncomfortable. They must receive no comfort. It must be talked about behind their backs, in front of them. Let them feel funny every time, every minute of their life. Because they are responsible for the situation the world is in today. Yes, thank you for that. So, Lennon, we're going to come over to you. And then Facebook, we are coming over because I'm looking at the great comments that are coming in. And I'm not sure if we have the option for phone calls, but we will entertain that as well. And then we're going to discuss where do we go from here? As Ken's mentioned, how can we turn this around? Is it even possible to turn it around? So, Lennon, your thoughts? Yeah, um, so I'll just like to add something to what Ken said. Um, corruption is is poisonous. Corruption is dangerous, and and corruption is also infectious. Corruption is as infectious as the COVID nineteen, I believe. And when you have desperation, when you have poverty, when you have high inequality of wealth, it 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 creates that environment for corruption to spread. Sometimes that desperation, sometimes that inequality like everything else is man-made and when it's man-made it's even worse and leadership is important because leadership is not just about making rules and, and and ruling over people it's living by example like i said before this subject has a lot more to do with our morality as human beings i think there are certain characters of humanity that has been ever since we we started settlement that is the the, the the selfishness a little bit of greed these are human qualities this is what makes us human and you know as 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 a christian nation we have been taught to have some lead or some control of that that's why we go to church to be able to handle those things and understand the implications of when there is an excess of of those those things and and when it gets to that point to call ourselves back to understand our humanity um it can be disastrous to ourselves and and having said that there while we're talking about that a couple of things came to my mind my mom would be proud of me when she heard that it says in the bible um it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle for rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And I'm saying this because, as I said before, Dominica is a Christian nation. We profess to be Christian. There's another story in the Bible that said um, there, were, there was like a, a, a church service or a, a, in, in, in the synagogues and the wealthy men were coming in and they were making their donations of thousands of dollars. And this one lady, she only had $20 and, and she put it put it in the collection. And her donation was seen as more valuable than the guys who were putting thousands of dollars. Why? Because she put all she had in there. Whereas, as you know, those guys with all their wealth, you know, put probably less than 1%. Um, we've also seen a lot of examples in the Bible that talks about wealth, the excess of wealth. Why is that the case? Because it can be the root of most of the evil we see happening around this world. When you when you talk about the imperial government, what were the imperial government all about? Wealth, wealth, power, and control. When you look at the politicians, what are they about? Wealth, power, and control. Most of the European nations abuse Africans and abuse other people because of wealth, power, and control. The, the, world, the world's richest countries have been built on the backs of of black people for wealth because of, of 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 want of wealth power and control so so the 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 point is the the thirst and the greed for accessing more and more and more can lead to most of the ills in society enslavement of other people cheating of other people imprisonment of other people denying other people um their 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 natural rights and liberties this is what we see so we have to be very guarded about people who don't put a limit on how much they can hoard um, while they hurt other people. And that is one of the bigger implications. It's what's happening is nothing new. It's just a different form because now we have the internet, we have we have stuff that can connect from one one part of the world to the next in a couple of in a couple of minutes. But that is the significance of it. I think this situation is playing to more on our us as a as a, a society, as humanity. We 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 are we have lost that moral compass. We have lost that moral guide. And how do I take that to Dominica? Here we are 
we have a constitution. Like I said before, the taxes are there for a purpose. People may want to put money in uh, offshore banks to, to evade taxes. People may want to push, uh, put money in offshore banks uh, to save for, we, for, for rainy days. But the point is, if you evade in taxes, then that means you are denying the, the, the working people, the, the, the less fortunate people, the opportunity for the government to use that collective resources to give them public education to give them free colleges, to get them out of poverty. Look at what we're talking in the U.S. The U.S. has the most millionaires in the world, right? There's a, there's a great inequality of wealth, yet still people, people go in debt for paying for colleges. I mean, people go in, they, 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 are, they are black families, they are families who go in debt for paying for colleges when the U.S. can provide free education. These are the things we're talking about. You go to places like Canada, they have a high tax rate. England has a high, higher tax rate than the US. So a lot of people use those offshore banks you know, to, to evade taxes. But what does that mean? No, in Canada, uh, I have family who live up there. You know, They, they have a, a more social programs. So the, the country is using these taxes. You can, you can if, you are, if you are a lady and you're expecting a baby, you can get maternity leave for a year, a year and a half. The society pays for that. Even right next door in Guadeloupe, we've heard stories of our, um, our people going out there and, and with kids, the government is is paying for this, you know, $1,000 per household for a kid, you know, and a lot of people take advantage of the situation where they have three and four or five kids and they depend on that because there's a social safety safety net. That is because of the high taxes they pay in this countries. So, so the taxes are there for a purpose to help people. Sometimes our own humanity, people take advantage of advantages of the situation. I believe in a society, everybody should work hard. And there's nothing wrong in somebody's gaining wealth through hard, honest work. Absolutely nothing wrong in that. That is not the issue. But the issue is when other people are expecting and, 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 and owning up to the rules and laws in the, in the country where, where, there's, where there's rules and taxes and the wealthy who's hoarding the people's money are evading those taxes for their own selfish purposes. That is destructive. That is corruption. And, and, and thieves also dress in jacket and tie. There are thieves in every rank of society from, from leadership down to the common man on the street. Thieves exist. And, and you, 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 can't, you, can't, you can't take the, the, the country's money, do as you please, and expect people to be happy. It doesn't work that way. And, and just as much as um, you know, somebody who is in charge of a grocery store or or, 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 or or a bank, a bank teller is swiping money from, from the cash register, is, is being convicted for stealing. There are politicians who do the same thing, and it's also it's also stealing. So so I think as as um, Ken says, corruption hurts, corruption is destructive, corruption kills. And I, I think when leaders and the heads are in it in and, and corrupt, what it does, it corrupts the entire society. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that, Lennon. Uh, Lambie, give me a thumbs up if we're able to take um, any phone calls at this point. Okay, so I guess run the phone numbers, please. The numbers are 449-3095, 449-3096, 449-3097, Three zero five four three two nine six two four. These are the numbers, and we're taking your phone calls right now. Yes, and as we're waiting for the phone calls to come in, I can finally have a minute to acknowledge everyone who's joining us via Facebook Live. Thank you so much for being here this evening and for your contributions. We see Jennifer Fidel Johnson, Owen Prosper, David uh, Joseph, Ty Francis, Louisa Pierce. So let's take some comments. Uh, David Joseph says, good evening. Let's see, Owen Prosper, good evening to the host guests and patriots. I'm locked in. Louisa Jean-Pierre, who is up very late in the UK with us. The very rich get away with avoiding taxes while the poor are the ones who get penalized. Peter Carbon is here with us. Uh, good to see you, Peter. Our government is elected to create the conditions for improvement in the quality of life. Louisa also says, not only the infrastructure, there are still many people who are still living in shacks since Maria. Let's see who else we have. Peter Dover is here with us. Good evening, Peter, nice to see you. 
Peter Joseph says, David jo Joseph says, Peter Carbon, the fact seems to be lost on a lot of people these days, especially in Dominica. The majority of Dominicans seem to be concerned only about themselves and what they can get from politicians and political parties. This is the sad reality. Ashanta Alexander, great to see you. Sabria Senhouse, always nice to have you on. Uh, let's see who else we have. Sabria says, tax avoidance is totally legal as opposed to tax evasion. People open offshore accounts to avoid taxes as well, not just to hide illegitimate funds. So thank you, everyone. Joanne uh, Raphael is here with us. Joanne, great to see you. Thank you for being here. Indigenous Bushman, always a pleasure. Havis, wonderful to see you. So uh, your thoughts on some of the comments? Uh, Pat, Kent, Lennon, any comments on the Facebook comments? Yes. Yeah, well, um, yeah, the, the person is right. Oh, I'm about... sorry, we have a call. One minute, oh, sorry, Kent, sorry. hold that thought. Yeah, good evening. Good yeah, evening. Yeah, we can good hear evening. You. yeah, good evening to everyone in the panel. Good evening. We have a situation where the leader of the government is so bold faced that we know we we are, there's, there's, there appears to be quite a bit of evidence that he may be involved in this stuff, but he gets angry when some other civil servant is suspected of, of getting involved in it, to the point where he makes a public statement to tell that public servant, you have so much time to correct this corruption. <laughs> and I find that so amusing. But, you know, that's the best word I could come up with. But he calls out that public servant to fix that bit of corruption in his department. And we see how, in other words, he's the only one that must be corrupt. Nobody below him must be corrupt. And I find that quite amazing. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Any other calls, Mandy? Yes, so Kent, you were about to say. Yeah, yeah. Well, well. If, if I were to respond just to the um, the caller a while ago, <laughs> the, the behavior of 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 our prime minister is um, is often a front. So um, there are some people he think he could fool, and who would believe that he is not corrupt. So by calling out somebody else, he may be seeking to give the impression that he himself is not corrupt, that someone else is corrupt. But I can almost guarantee you, anybody he, he calls out is most likely someone he has fallen out with, someone that who is not directly helping him in his own corruption. Somehow he has something, some, something against them or they have against him and they have fallen out. Short of that, He's simply trying to deflect and hide and pretend. But corrupt leaders um, often um, accept a certain level of corruption under them because when they accept a certain level of corruption, they in turn can exploit that so that they can, um, those, those corrupt persons who enjoy some of the corruption themselves would in turn be able to to assist them and work with them. So anytime they call out, call out anybody else, just know it's because the relationship somewhere is broken and there's not a direct link between them. So we, yes. we, we have to understand this about this prime minister. Um, yes, we have a call coming in. Sorry, Ken. That's good. Hello? Oh, caller, please go ahead. Yeah, good night. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear yes. loud and clear. Okay, good, good evening to members of the panel. No, this West Minister system is not working for us in the Caribbean. When you can tell me a man cannot account for a couple billions of dollars, but you still vote for him. When you have a prime minister who says that he's going to stay there for 50 years, and when he leaves, he's going to put his son there, then this, you, are, you, are, you are leaving room for corruption and for money laundering and all kind of stuff. Because we should have people in power for only 10 years, two terms. After two terms, you cannot there, come back again, all, like America. But in Dominica, you can stay there 50 years there, and bring in your child, there, yeah. bring in your wife yeah. to take over. So that is where the problem lies. If, if this government 
officials know that they only have two terms. And after two terms, they have to get on, and they will be investigated. Then they will be more careful. But when, you, when you're in power, you, you, you cannot account for billions of dollars. And the people still voting for you because you give them handouts. And you, you stay there for 50 years. That is where the problem is. We have to deal with the problem. Good evening. Yes, thank you for that. Thank you for that, caller. Um, Pat, you wanted to um, chime in? I, I can go. Yes, go ahead, Lennon. You can join. You can join. Us. Yeah, yeah. So one of your Facebook commenters made an important point. They said tax avoidance is not illegal, but tax evasion is illegal, and that's that. That's important to note because at the end of the day, I think sometimes when we get in a routine of doing things, we don't think of why we do it. So paying taxes is basically, simply put, it is. A, a, an unspoken agreement that we're going to put our monies together to help build the country. That's what it is. And, and in a country, there are certain levels of taxation. So you have, if you make a certain amount of money that is, is so low, it can't take care of you and your, your family, then you, you don't pay as, as much income tax. You, you do pay taxes because you, you pay taxes on, on, on stuff you buy in the store, food, clothing, whatever the case, and other services. Um, you see that discussion in America where they're trying to raise funds for their programs and they're talking about taxing and increased taxes on the rich. So that's understandable. It's it's a social agreement um, so, where we put our money together and those who have more put a little more, those who have less and can't afford to put, you know, the ones who have more uh, um, supplement the ones that don't have enough. It's unspoken. Sometimes we do it and we don't even think about it because it's just part of what we do, but we don't think of the depth of that. Now, sometimes taxes are done as um, to to gain re to gain action to gain reaction. Um, if if for example uh, in the U.S., I'll use the U.S. As, a, as an example. There 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 were companies who were who were moving offshore, um, going into other countries to establish businesses to avoid paying the taxes that were in America for companies. Um, so what the government will do, they will say, okay, well, we'll reduce taxes on these companies to let them come back. So you, you use taxes for, a government use taxes for different purposes. Taxes can also be used punitively. But then when, when you have all these reasons for using taxes, you would ask that simple question, why would somebody want to avoid paying taxes? There are reasons why you'd want to avoid paying taxes. Taxes can, avoiding paying taxes can also be a form of revolt. Because if I'm in a system where I'm paying taxes and the taxes that irresponsibly manage or irresponsibly use, then I am going to say I'm not paying taxes to this government because it's being wasted on stuff that doesn't help the common society. So we have that responsibility. So I am okay when just as much as when a government or a government decides to impose taxes on people um, uh, um, uh, for, for action, we can decide we're not paying taxes as a form of rebellion. For example, I'll take it back to Dominica. We have a situation where parliament cannot account for the passport sales. Our parliament cannot account for all the construction that is going on in Dominica. Yet still, the government talks about paying taxes. There is VAT, there is all that stuff. So if we have gained billions of dollars of selling passports and you still have a 15% VAT on everything, the people of Dominica can revolt by not paying taxes because there is no responsibility, there is no answer from the government as to how our money is managed. Now, if you're selling my passport and I see I'm seeing Chinese building buildings and all this kind of, of activities, and the people cannot account for the 400 or the billions of dollars that we see, the people of Dominica could decide we're not paying taxes for the next year or two unless the government accounts for everything. That's a form of, of tax avoidance. Now, the reason why tax evasion is illegal, it's for the same reasons, because if a society needs the taxes to develop and there are people who are evading the taxes, especially the wealthy, and you have, you have poor education, poor health care, poor schools, uh, poor roads, and you cannot afford to do that. Then, then it's 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 also criminal to do that because you are you are basically breaking the unspoken contract you have to aid and assist in the development of your country through your taxes. So, so, so if you look at it from this perspective, it, it's it's not just hey, you know, we we put in our money in offshore bank because of that, but it has implications for our society. So, so unless there is there is activism from from the people understanding that at the end of the day 
the, the leadership doesn't also only come from the top. Leadership comes from the masses. The masses have shown they can mobilize in the past, and we can do it today to, to redirect our government into doing what is right. Yes, thank you for that, Lennon. And, and of course, we want to, you know, the time is not um, with us today. It's running away. Uh, it's running ahead of us. But where do we go, go from here? As Kent mentioned, how do we turn this around? And I want us to explore that in the context of what we see going on in Grand Bay with the by-elections being held tomorrow. Tomorrow, Thursday, November 25th, the by-elections in Grand Bay. And one of the things that handbag uh, Julius Gabriel, who I had the opportunity to interview twice during this process mentioned, is he still sees on the ground money being given out, 21 of the candidates on the ground in Grand Bay, giving out uh, money to uh, the folks of Grand Bay, windows, uh, doors, everything being given out in Grand Bay as an incentive for people of Grand Bay to vote. So how do we turn this around when we continue to see more and more examples of corruption, the corruption that we're talking about? And if there's one thing that we've learned between the Panama and Pandora pick papers, for example, is that there needs to be more regulations of the tax codes. And I just want to throw this in as well. You know, the Guardian reports that the Pandora papers also place a revealing spotlight on the offshore system itself in a development likely to prove embarrassing for the U.S. President Joe Biden, who has pledged to lead efforts internationally to bring transparency to global finance system. The U.S. emerges from the leak as the leading tax haven. The file suggests that the state of South Dakota in particular is, shel is sheltering billions of dollars in wealth linked to individuals previously accused of serial financial crimes. So when we take all of this into consideration from Grand Bay to the US being on the forefront of uh, some of what we are talking about, how is it even possible that we can have a conversation about turning it around? And Pat, if you can hear us, we'd like to start with you. Well, turning it around, Simone, is certainly not an easy task because, like um, a caller mentioned a little while ago, and Lennon, I think, alluded to it as well, a man is stealing your money. The man is lawless, unapologetically lawless. He's swagging with your money and giving you a little bit of it and you're voting for him. It seems to me that people have given up. It, that, that is a sign of ungodliness. That is a sign of, of people who have no confidence in themselves. They feel as themselves have nothing. That a man can come and take what is yours and give you a little scrap out of it and you're voting for him and you're picking up the man. It, it is very difficult for a sensible person to understand, you know. That means you have given up. You have given up your humanity. You have given up your your the, 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 any possibility that you can succeed. You have given up everything you have. You understand? So, like, you're not punishing the man. You're picking up the man and you're encouraging the man. It is not easy to turn that around because you're talking about generational um, degradation. It's not easy to turn it around. It will take yes. long. It will take several more Lumumbas, many Lumumbas, to do that. I remember I, I watched a, a video of um, Vincent Anderson who, um, being questioned by um, the, that organization regarding the situation in Dominica, the last election, and, and um, the situation at Salisbury. And this guy is questioning Vincent Anderson, and they question him and more or less apologizing to him, you know. You know, mm -hmm. so I'm wondering who is standing for right in the world? Who is, uh, uh, you know, apart from the lonely voice of Lumumba, who, who, you know, and I mean, who, who really doesn't hold any public position? I mean, who is standing for the world? Who, which president of which country? You, we heard a little of, of Angel Nembekel, who, 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 who's, who's term as president. She, she really showed a level of honesty and humility, which is unmatched, I would say. 
but who, who, which president of which country, who is going to take a stand to for the world because the world is in, is, is shattered by corruption and wickedness and evil people. Who is going to is not is the wrong I I for for now. I can come up with any any um, suggestion, but I know it's not an easy task because it's a it's a generational degradation that has happened there. It's not easy. Yes, thank you for that, um, Pat Kent. How do we turn this around when yes. we continue to see examples in Granby? Right. Well, let me start from where Pat left off because I, I agree, Pat, it's not an easy task. And when you look at the world, and uh, you'd realize that we are gripped uh, by a global phenomena, and it looks as if many of these governments are also linked and they protect each other, and they're involved in corruption together. I mean, a very good example of that, you would see what happened in our last elections. When I believe the other prime ministers from Barbados, St. Lucia, Grenada, um, St. Vincent, I think they all knew what was going on in Dominica. But yet, rather than correct their compatriot, rather than correct their friend, they sent their armies in here to prevent the people from making the change that the people wanted to make. So you have to wonder, are these guys stupid? I know Mayor is not stupid. I know, I know, I know wrong in, in, in Antigua. Is not, these are not foolish guys. I think they know exactly what they're doing and they protect each other. And chances are they involved in corruption together. So that's a world phenomena that we have to, we have to contend with. Look also what's going on with the pandemic and with all of these companies um, pushing the vaccination and I'm not against the vaccination, but if you seriously look at what's going on, you'd realize there's a corruption ring going on there too. You'd realize that, that maybe our own governments are, 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 have been given um, incentives to push the vaccine on our people. I am beginning to be convinced of that. I am beginning to be convinced that the reason why um, many governments are not in the interest of their own people promoting repurposed drugs such as ivermectin, which has been shown in many other countries, including Japan, when they allowed the use of ivermectin, somehow miraculously they brought down a great wave. The reason why they are not doing this, you have to wonder whether they are in cahoots with some of these drug companies paying them money to do certain things. So this corruption seemed to be a global phenomenon. But I stopped there because I wanted to bring it down to us. Because what I realized is that we can create a special Dominic, and we here in Dominica can decide, you know, something, we're going to be different. If the world wants to go down that way, that's them. But we have to start where we are, and maybe we'll end up being an example that can blaze the light for the rest of the world. So we've got to start with us. We have corrupt ones in our midst. We have those who have stolen money from us. So the question is, how do we stop them? How do we turn it around? And I would have to say that I believe we are on the right track. And let me explain what I mean. Because where it starts is by rejecting corrupt officials. And I have to say in Dominica, we have already rejected the corrupt officials in the Labour Party. But they have forced themselves on us by stealing the elections, by corruption, by, by bribery. They have forced themselves on us. And we all know the stories. I don't have to rehash the stories of what went on last elections. But we all know if it wasn't for the bribery and corruption, chances are they would have lost the last elections. I'm, I'm convinced they would have lost the last election. They would have gained some seats, but they would have lost. So what has brought us to that point? The fact is they're talking like we do, the sharing of people, making people understand how corruption hurts us. It puts people in a position to say, we reject that because our, our development has been affected because we could be better off if we reject that. So we have to continue sharing with people and it starts with rejecting the features. So we, we, we have to hope and pray that, that, that we find a way to prevent them from cheating because the, the work has already started. We're already educating people. We are, we are there. We just have to get that bigger swing to overcome their corruption or we have to find a way to prevent them from being corrupted. And we have to appeal to the other prime ministers, do not send your armies again to prevent the people from getting the kind of change that they want or for demonstrating in ways that are legitimate. 
So, so it starts by rejecting, continue to educate people so that we can reject. We have to also send certain other certain messages because you know what some people will say? Some people will say, but you know, if we change these guys, every other person will be the same. The other guys we elect might be the same. That's what some people will say to you. And that's part of the reason why they may hang on to what's already there. But we have to educate people. First of all, it's not true. There are those of us who are not like that. We have demonstrated that in our lives, in our past lives. So first, and there have been examples of, of very good politicians throughout history, throughout the world. There are good examples as well as bad examples. So first of all, that's not true. But secondly, even if that's true, we have to drive on, or even if persons think so, we have to let them understand that you ought to keep a government on their toes. If the government is going to think that they can simply come and tell you the other guys will do the same thing and for that reason you'll keep them there, then you give them a free pass. You've got to keep governments thinking, boy, I have to be on my toes. I have to think twice about engaging in corruption, otherwise the people will kick me out. So even if another current government comes, at least they will take some time before they get there. Although I don't believe that, well, I think they are good persons. If we choose wisely, if we choose uh, with a heart, um, we will find good people. And when we realize that they are corrupt as well, then you kick them out. But if we do that consistently, but well, we have to share that message. We have to keep sharing that message with these people. And there's one other thing I want to touch on. There are other things, but let me just touch on this other one. There is a role for non-government organizations as well. You know, um, Pat, you mentioned making people feel guilty. That's, that's very important, you know. That's very important in terms of controlling the corruption. But there's a role for non-government organizations. And I want to, to make an appeal to, to our, our people who, who are, the, are the vanguards of morality in our land, our churches, our church leaders, the people who, 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 are, who are supposed to, 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 to stand for righteousness. As I said at the beginning, it says righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. They have a great role to play. They have a great role to play, and they have to fear God rather than man. What I'm beginning to find is that people have a false sense of, righteous, of righteousness or unrighteousness. And our churches must begin to teach about that and must begin to exhibit that. So if you're involved in fornication or if you're involved in outright theft, stealing something um, you know, in a supermarket, they, they would easily condemn that. But they wouldn't condemn the other types of unrighteousness, maybe for fear of a man or something. Our churches have to begin to tell people sin is sin. We cannot keep making what people think. Like, like for instance, you would have people not recognizing that the government that we have, they are thieves and robbers. And because they are thieves and robbers and they are not legitimate, our prayer should be, Lord, deliver us from these thieves and robbers. But we have people who have a form of righteousness and rather they would pray for God to bless the man to lead the land. We have to be praying for God to deliver us from these unrighteous, wicked people. Let's get our righteousness right and correct. There are people in our land who, who would, who would um, go to um, a government official or a prime minister, somebody, and maybe they were, to, they were to get some favor, some job, and they would think of that favor and that job as a blessing. Rather than saying, you know something, I don't want a job that I am not eligible for. I don't want a scholarship I am not eligible for. It is not a blessing. It's corruption. You have got to teach people to call wrong, wrong. The wrongs are not just the obvious wrongs. They are deep wrongs. And our, our churches, I have to say, many of our churches have failed in condemning unrighteousness. Many of our churches have not been like John the Baptist who would call and tell Herod, you are an adulterer and you will stop it. Because we are afraid of politicians. We are afraid of losing our members. We are afraid of the offering plate. And we are failing up. And I want to call on our churches and our Christians to be the vanguards of righteousness in our land. And, it, and there are other groups that can do that as well. But we have to start this process of saying enough is enough. We won't upstep your corruption. I remember talking to someone. 
And I was asking them, but why don't you all speak more about the wrong in our land? You know, they said to me, you know, their pastor said, you know, you know, you know, he doesn't know for sure what, what, what's going on. Um, he don't want to, uh, to condemn people. Man, come on, get off it. You live in a small country. You don't know that there's unrighteousness in the land. When you see fornication, you would speak about it on your pulpit. But now you are seeing unrighteousness and you are failing to tell your people that, this is un that there is unrighteousness. Even if you don't want to directly point fingers that say that there is unrighteousness in the land. And then we cannot condone a government that is stealing. If they're doing it, they should stop. You cannot say that. You cannot be the vanguard of righteousness. I want to call on some of our pastors and our teachers and our, and our priests to become the vanguards of righteousness. They will be a major front in turning around on righteousness in our land and making these people feel guilty. That is those who are involved in the high crime and those who are leading the process. But also um, appealing to our people to live righteously and do not accept bribes and get away from corruption and do not call wrong right. We have to have our, our institutions of, 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 of morality at the forefront of that fight. Yes, yes. Thank you, Ken. And, and then, of course, there are a number of other things that once we rid ourselves of a bad government, there are a number of other things we've got to be looking at. But I'll stop here. If we have time, we'll come back to those. Yes, so I'll come back for you for your final thoughts so you can um, tell us about those ideas. But thank you. And I think one of the overarching um, points that we're seeing being raised here as I listen to you speak, Kent, is the, the, the issue of trust. Because now that we realize that we cannot trust you in one particular arena, then it sorts of throws a shadow over other areas. So now here, maybe the vaccines are legitimate and they have been acquired a legitimate way and they're interested in helping the population. But because the population feels that they cannot trust you in other matters, then it trickles down into right. other areas of life. So I'm really happy that you brought that point up. Now, as we get ready to wind down, Lennon, I'm going to come over to you and then Pat over to you um, for your final thoughts. And then we want to make sure we take some of more of the comments on Facebook. So, Lennon, over to you. Yeah, I, I smile and nodded my head in agreement with Kent. I, I, I mean, I can't say it better. Kent sounded like an evangelist. There. I thought he was John the Baptist for a second. So, so, um, but, um, but, um, you know, the change, the change always start with us. The change always start with us. And and like you know, I mentioned earlier, we are talking more about a morality issue than anything else. And I will mention Christianity because Dominica has professed to be a Christian nation. We see during election campaign how, how the church has been used and religion has been used to garner votes. And, and it starts with us. When we go to church and listen to the preaching, it's not to sit there and look at who's sinning and what other people are doing and tell them to change their ways, but it's for us to reflect on our human weakness and make that change from within. Say I had enough, and I think collectively if everybody come to that conclusion that I had enough, I need to be better. I need to stand up. I need to talk against the wrong. Like Kent just this, I, I'm explained, we will see that change happening. It doesn't start with Kent making a decision. It doesn't start with you. It doesn't, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody else. That's why I'm here. I am speaking because I think I have to make a difference. And I think that is where we need, we need to go. As, as it talks about taxes, now, collectively, there are events that have shown us how things work. We remember in the in the in the American Revolution in the Boston Tea Party, the Americans said, uh, "No taxation without representation." We have seen uh, kings and and in the French Revolution when when people were suffering and starving, the kings and queens were in their house. Uh, uh, Louis XVI and and uh, um, I can't remember her name right now, but um, you know they were having a ball oblivious to the suffering of the people on the outside. When the people had enough, what happened? What happened? We saw the revolution in Russia and these areas where, where the monarchs, the monarchs who were hoarding everything for themselves, they were toppled because what? People stand up. The masses stood up. I heard Mia Motley made a comment and I, I brought it up because she gave a speech everybody's talking, um, uh, talking about. And she said, it's up to 200 people in the room in Glasgow to make a difference. I totally disagree. I totally disagree because these 200 men and women did not automatically get to the position they are. What it takes to make change is the masses, not the 200 people, but the, the millions of people that say enough is enough. We have the numbers. How can I have 
come to an election every five years one man comes begging me begging me to vote for him to put him in that position to lead then he disrespects the constitution he violates our young people he he abuses our elderly and you talk about trust i can i can give somebody a chance but it's not just one situation it's time and time and time again how, how can we see ed regis being disrespected in parliament, irrespective of his personal life or personality. He's told that we have to raise funds. We don't have money to do what you want. But more, weeks after his death, we've seen money spending in the constituents like crazy. How can the Labour Party have more money than the country? How, 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 how can the, 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 the man in charge have one company, MMC, building airports, building hospitals, with no oversight from parliament, when the same taxes is what runs a country. So anything else belongs to the country and we sit there and we accept it. I can, so I'm standing up and I'm speaking. I think everybody have to examine their conscience, just like we go to church every Sunday. The, 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 the priest, the bishop is not asking you to examine your, your neighbor's conscience. You know? It's not asking you to examine your community's conscience. It's asking each and every one of us to examine our conscience, examine our conscience, understand our human weakness, to try our best to overcome that need or that greed for excess. That, that, that feeling of insecurity and that feeling that I have to hold to survive, that feeling that I have to look down on my brother or my sister to feel better about myself. That feeling of jealousy because somebody has a fancy car, they might have sold drugs to do it. That feeling of I should get a car to let me go steal to do it. That kind of human weakness, we have to fight against it. That is not, that's a personal fight. And collectively, if we can get to that point, we can, we can wake up as a nation and realize enough is enough. Evil is run in Dominica. Dominica is not run by a, a democracy. It's a kleptocracy run in Dominica. They are thieves in high places. And, 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 and as a result, they've corrupted the entire system. And unless we collectively examine ourselves and realize I can do it myself, Ken can do it with himself, you can speak. All that talk has to get into action. And we have every five years, every time somebody leaves, Right now, we have a decision in Grand Bay to make whether we want to carry on with this kind of government, with this kleptocracy, with this, with this thievery that's been going on. And the people have the power. The people always have the power. The problem is we are manipulated to think we don't. And when people like Mia Motley comes and she says 200 people can change the world, this is BS. What changed the world is we, the masses make that change it has yes. always happened yes. it has always happened in the past and i think collectively when we have enough and the people right remember earlier i said there's a natural law when you have two extremes there is a gradient and that gradient leads to instability it happens in the natural law it happens in the scientific law it happens in the moral law if you have very few rich people and a lot of poor people there is going to be instability. If you have high temperature and low temperature next to one another, you get hurricanes. Anytime there is a gradient, you get you get volatility, you get pressure. So if if we don't pay attention to the laws of nature, we don't pay attention to the laws of nature, we'll be doomed to fail and make the same mistakes because of our human weakness, our immorality takes over. And if we don't put a lid on this immorality, then that's what happened, the decay of society, the deterioration of our youth, the deterioration of our leaders, the deterioration of our health, the deterioration of our wealth, and ultimately our own destruction. Yes, thank you for that, Lennon. Very well put. Uh, Pat, your final thoughts as we get ready to wind up? Yes, Simon. I too want to big up Ken for the um, session he had a, a moment ago. And I want to add to it because what I want to add to it is that we must be more, we must be specific about words. We must use words in the correct context. We must not call thieves honorable men. We must not refer to them as honorable. And, and if a man di didn't win an election free and fair, we should not refer to him as prime minister. That is giving him and giving them... <coughs> You, you know, you're bigging them up. But if, if, if you stop referring to them like that, they will feel guilty. 
they will feel that they're in a position, but they are not respected in the position because they do not deserve it. We must not call these guys honorable. They are not honorable. We must use, listen, words are important, you know. In the beginning was the word, and the word became flesh. And the word is the most potent power of all human endeavor. Word, song, and power. We must use words correctly because our words will liberate us or it will beat us up. That's my last contribution for the night. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much, Pat. And Kent, we want to come over to you for your final thoughts. But before we do, let's just take some quick comments from our uh, very engaged Facebook Live audience. Uh, Joanne Raphael, by the way, Joanne is from ByDominicaOnline.com. So we truly appreciate her being here this evening. When we know better, we should do better. We need to hold our leaders accountable. David Joseph, absolutely. The problem is that once that corrupt leader belongs to the party that we support, then it is not a problem, sad. Sabria says the US has implemented FATCA to try to deal with the tax evasion issue, but the problem is finding these foreign accounts. Uh, Havis, Havis says if Dominicans uh, continue to elect individuals who are corrupted, I don't know what to say. God help them. Uh, let's see, just a couple more quickly. Annette Philip, always great to have you on board. Uh, Ragador, uh, go do, unless the people understand that it's going to take a collective action to reverse what looks like irreversible situation. And then he says, Nufini back. So I want to thank everyone, the Facebook Live audience, for your wonderful contribution. I always look forward to engaging with you on these important topics. So Kent, you have the final word for the program. All right. Well, th thank you, everyone, for, um, for the opportunity. And But the last point I wanted to make is that once we get ourselves to the position where we have elected better governance, a better government. That new government has quite a task in ensuring that we readjust our system so that it better serves us and that we can have um, begin to, to entrench a different culture, um, a culture of righteousness, a culture of integrity, and a number of things. I think one of your callers called and mentioned one possible um, solution, which is the... Um, um, multi, sorry, limited term limits in, in government. I, I think that's, that's that's one of the things. But there are a number of other things. Some of them we haven't placed in Dominica, but they have been abused. Things like integrity in public office legislation, um, access to public information. We have to get into for feature um, legislation. We have to make those who are involved in corruption think twice that they will be investigated, and when they are formed. The, the the assets will be will will be forfeited, and um, and they will pay the price, and we've got to make a, a few good examples as well, because when we make those examples, other people will see, and they will think twice. These are things we've got to do. We've got to be involved in the process of re-educating our society to entrench a different culture. We we, we we've got to get involved in. In, 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 in putting in clear rules and that, that will cause people to know exactly um, what's the way to go. Close all of these loopholes these guys are using in one way or the other. A new government will have quite a task on their, um, on their hands. So I would just want to say to our people, all is not lost. We can create a special country. We cannot lose hope. We cannot give up on taking back our country. Part of the job is already done because the majority of us have already rejected them. We just now have to find a way to prevent them from cheating. We've got to find a way to get more people on board by continuing to speak to people and continuing to demonstrate to people that better can be done. There's so much more we could say, but we've got to find a way. But importantly too, we've got to act and then we've got to pray. We've got to continue to pray because I, I'm personally convinced and I know that it is not as simple as hit the eye. And it's not just in Dominica. I would tell you all through the world, there are many of these corrupt officials that are getting involved in the dark side of life, in iniquity, in Dominica and in other countries. And part of what a righteous people will do 
is they will stand up. They will themselves be righteous. They will themselves walk righteously. They will themselves walk in integrity. They will do everything they can to demonstrate that. But they will also put their knees and pray. And there are many praying people. And we've got to reverse the iniquity in our lives. Some of you may not understand what I'm talking about at that point. But I'm telling you, there's a lot of iniquity in our land. And there are people who have been praying. And we are believing. And they are believing that this iniquity will end. But all of these things have to come together. Because we have a special country. We can be different. We have to make Dominica different. Yes, thank you for that, Kent. And of course, Kent Vital, Lennon Matthew, Pat Aaron, we want to thank you for being our panelists this evening as we explore the Pandora Papers, what it is and why should we care. And of course, if you join us late, uh, you can always check out q95da.com tomorrow for the entire program. So if you miss any portion of the program, jump on q 95 DA.com for the entire program as well as all the other um, programs on Q95. And it seems I missed one person on the Facebook Live. My cousin, Shapo Lockhart, is actually on the live. So great to see you out there in St. Martin. And don't forget, if you're in the Grand Bay area, you want to go out and exercise your constitutional right to vote in the by election tomorrow. So everyone who's eligible should be out there voting. And if you're just interested in getting to know Mr. Julius uh, Gabriel just a little bit better, I did have the opportunity to do two interviews with him. So you can head on over to pushpast10.com and click on the YouTube channel link to see the interview. So again, P-U-S-H-P-A-S-T, the number 10.com for more information about Mr. Julius Gabriel. So again, I want to thank everyone for joining us today, our Q95 uh, listening audience, our Q95 Facebook audience, Mr. G, the Q95 family, Lambi, as always, thank you for being on the console showing. Thank you for keeping us connected. And so we will continue. We'll continue to tap into our experts in Dominica and overseas as we look at all the changes that are going on in the world around us. And hopefully the next topic, we'll be able to find some more positives in terms of the changes that are going on around us. So we'll continue to look at concrete and practical um, economic opportunities to gain financial independence um, for Dominica, and especially for our young people. You know, the time ran out on us this evening, but it is so important that with everything that we do, we keep the young people in mind because they are the ones who will inherit Dominica and the world by extension. So sure again, I'm Simone Matthew. It has been wonderful being with you for this time with Roots Connections on Q95. Don't forget to follow YSQFM and Push Past 10 on Facebook Live as we continue to tap in to the expertise of our Dominican brothers and sisters at home and abroad. And let's see if I missed any comments on Facebook before we go. Nope, I got everyone. So again, good evening to everyone. Have a restful night and all the best if you're in the Grand Bay area. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right, have a good night. Uh, See you guys. Good... Thank you. Good. All right.